Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to see everybody come out this evening, and I also want to thank the Lord for a beautiful evening. Is it not just so, so beautiful outside? Um, the weather is pleasant, and there's no wind, and it would be just an enjoyable evening. So I'm thankful that you're here. Um, my name is Rhoda Kana, and I'm the Health Ministries Director for um, the Greenville Seventh Avenue Church. And this is our quarterly dinner with the doctor. We have dinners um, four times a year in January, in April, in June, and in September. So um, when you came in and registered tonight, you got a little card um, for the next dinner with the doctor, which is with Dr. Brad MD. He's an optometrist here in Greenville, and he'll be speaking on eye health and how nutrition impacts eye health. In fact, you'll learn probably that your eye is a window to the health of your, your body, and um, you'll not want to miss that program. If you've not been here before, I'd just like to introduce you, not introduce you, but let you know where the restrooms are and the water fountain, which is, um, if you go out these doors, it's to the right, okay? The boys are passing out the recipes. I was sitting at the table, the registration, thinking something is missing. <laughs> and I couldn't think of what it was until I was just ready to come up here and I realized, oh, I forgot to put the recipes out. So. I want to do that now, is to go over the recipes. Do most of you have them by now? Okay. So what we have for you tonight, and it's a sack lunch that you'll be taking home, we have an oat burger. Um, and I'd like to just talk a little bit about the oat burger. If you look at the recipe, you'll see um, it, ha it has one tablespoon of tomato paste. Now you're thinking, um, I have to open a can of tomato paste just for one tablespoon. What I do when I open up a can, I use what I need, and then whatever's left over, I freeze it, and I put it in tablespoon serving sizes. So there are lots of recipes that you'll need just one tablespoon or two tablespoons, and you'll have it available for, for yourself right away. So it's not a waste. Um, just freeze in tablespoon serving sizes, whatever you need. Molasses is the next ingredient um, that I'd like to highlight, and um, that is the grandma's molasses. If you use blackstrap molasses, just use less because, of course, that's quite a bit stronger. The Bragg's liquid aminos, um, you can, it's a um, fermentation free soy sauce, and uh, uh, you can find that in Ingalls and at Food City. The vegetarian beef style seasoning is something you could get at the mustard seed in Newport or at the health barn here in town. And nutritional yeast flakes, I also get them at the health barn or at the mustard seed in Newport or if you would go to one of the Mennonite stores, um, Mountain View or Troyer's, uh, they have it as well. How many of you have eaten an oat burger in the past? Okay, several of you. You'll see at the bottom that um, it asks for two cups regular oats and one cup quick oats. Uh, sometimes recipes call for all quick oats, but I'll just tell you my personal opinion. If you use all quick oats, you end up with something like cold oatmeal, and to me that's not very appealing. <laughs> so I like to use regular oats to make it a little bit more bulky, and then it doesn't taste, that, taste that quite that way. But um, you'll find, I believe, these oat burgers that we are going to be giving you tonight, when you leave, um, to be very flavorful, and you will like them. Um, what I also like to do when I make oat burgers is to add uh, ground flax seed. Can anybody tell me why I would want to do that? For a thickener, yes. But there's a better reason. <laughs> it provides, it's a good source of omega-3, right? 
And we want to, we tend to get a lot of omega-6 in our diet, but we'd like to off-balance it with omega-3. And so flaxseed is a good source of omega-3. Um, omega-3 tends to be anti-inflammatory, where um, omega-6 tends to be a little more pro-inflammatory. And if you have too much inflammation, it's not good in the sense that it contributes to many disease processes. So good sources of omega-3 are flax, walnuts, what else? Chia seeds, kidney beans, edamame beans. How many of you like edamame beans? Yes, they're great. Um, there are healthy sources of, of um, omega-6 as well, such as peanut butter, avocado, tofu, and you will hear lots of people say that um, fish is a good source of omega-3, and it, and it truly is. But we don't really recommend it because of all the other toxins and such that are also found in fish. So if you can stay away from that and use flax or walnuts or chia seeds, edamame beans as your source of uh, omega-3, you will be doing better. Okay, the next thing I want to show you is how to make the oat burger. So you're going to put all these um, ingredients in a saucepan except the walnuts and the oats. And you're just you're going to heat the liquid up. And then you're going to add the oats, allow it to sit and to thicken. And then when you make your burger, you're, you're going to, or this is how I like to do it. I take a large ring um, from a, a mason jar and I put it on my pan, and I press into it the oat meal or the, the um, burger product that I'm, I'm making, and I just push it into there. And then I remove it, and then you, then you have the burger. Okay, so it's a real simple way. Instead of trying to form it in your hands or use a scoop and press it down, then they're all uniform, and they stack nicely in the in the container that you're keeping them in. And the other thing about O burgers is that you can uh, freeze them very well. So if you, th this recipe makes 14, you can, um, you can freeze what you don't use and just pull them out one at a time as you're um, making your lunches. Okay, the next is the quinoa packed, um, or protein packed, let me see what's the exact title of it. Protein packed salad. Um, nothing special about that, except I want to tell you one thing about quinoa is that you need to rinse it very well <clears throat> before you um, cook it in, uh, on the stove in, <clears throat> in either water or vegetable broth. Um, are there any questions about the recipes? Okay. Well, I hope you try them at home, but of course, um, you'll get to sample them tonight <clears throat> or take it home for your lunch tomorrow. Our speaker lecturer tonight is uh, Dr. Jeremy Wetmore. He is a graduate of Southern Adventist University in 2001 from college. He mm, with his Bachelor of Science degree in biology. He then went on to the University of Pikeville in Kentucky and uh, graduated there from the College of Osteopathic Medicine with his Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine, right? Yeah. Okay, and then he internshiped at Michigan State University, um, Kalamazoo Center for Medical Studies. He went on to Detroit Medical Center and Wayne State University Rehabilitation Institute of Michigan for his residency and finished there in 2012. And then right after that, he moved here to Tennessee, to Morristown, um, Tennessee. And um, he currently practices in Morristown with health, uh, through Health Star. His interests are music, outdoor sports, and uh, backpacking. 
He also enjoys walking the Appalachian Trail. So we're really thankful to have Dr. Um, Wetmore with us tonight. He is a father of two girls and is married to Marta. But before he talks to us tonight, Pastor Jeremy Arnold will have a short devotional for us and prayer. Good evening. We want to welcome you to the Greenville Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, Jeremy and I often get mixed up because we get here our name and we both look up and uh, I'm a twin as well and so I all my life I guess I've been used to being mixed up but want to uh, just share with you a few thoughts before we begin you know I understand and let's just pray if you will uh, as we consider a few thoughts from his word dear Lord we thank you it's uh, been a beautiful day it's been a good day and we praise you for that each breath we take is a gift and we thank you be with us now we ask in Jesus name amen so I looked up neuropathy um, because I, I, I'm acquainted with the idea, but I don't know a lot about it. And it's, of course, Dr. Jeremy Wetmore is going to share that with us. But um, I just wanted to know, you know, what is this exactly? And just according to a quick search online, it said it's weakness, numbness, and pain from nerve, nerve damage. Weakness numbness and pain from nerve damage. So you're about to hear much more about that and, and ways to, to help that condition. I have a good friend who has neuropathy in his foot. And so I, I can see that it can cause a great deal of pain. But what came to my mind when I read that from a scriptural standpoint is that sounds much like the Laodicean condition of which Revelation speaks of in chapter 3. If maybe you might not be familiar with what that condition is in, in the Bible and there in Revelation 3, but you'll find there in Revelation 2 and 3 that there's seven churches. And they, if you um, do a careful study of that, you will find that those churches represent the history of God's church since he ascended into heaven up to the, the very last day. And so it's a grand sweeping panorama of uh, church history through the course and the real life condition of these seven churches in John's day. And the church there in Laodicea has this counsel given to it. And I read to you from Revelation chapter 3, and it's in verse, verse um, 16, verse 15. Well, I know your works, God says. This is red ink. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you. This is God speaking to his church of today. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. For as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. And behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. For to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. These words from God that are directed to his church, to his people in these last days, are to addressing the issue of what I would say is something akin to neuropathy. For there is a numbness, a um, pain, yes, but a numbness to their true spiritual condition. They hurt, yes. They know it's not right. There's not a proper connection 
that's taking place there. And so in their numbness, they, they think they're all right, when in reality, they're lukewarm. What does that look like, realistically, or practically speaking, in everyday life? Well, the, the Bible speaks of what we often refer to as the unpardonable sin. It's this, it's this sin against the Holy Spirit, of which Jesus spoke of in Luke 12, 10. It, it's this notion that I am refusing to repent, to give to God something of which he has asked. It could be something little, it could be something big, but if I'm holding back in any way with my, with my Savior, then I literally can't go through the next door that he opens up. And oh, the, the journey God wants to take each of us on, right? When I enter into such a condition, if I should, and I say, Lord, I'm good with this, but I can't go any further right now, not now, and I share with him all my excuses, then I enter into what is somewhat of a possible Laodicean condition. The Bible calls it a carnal Christian. They're, they're not exactly spiritual in the full sense of the word, for they're not, they have been satisfied with just a little bit of the Holy Spirit, like those five foolish virgins in Matthew 25. But they don't deny God in as much as they say, well, I, I still claim to be a follower of the king. And so they're not, they're not um, the, the wicked, as the Bible refers to them, and they're not spiritual, they're, they're carnal. They want to have their cake and eat it too, you might say. And in such a condition, the Bible says that you become lukewarm, so that you think you're okay, but you're numb to the true condition of what you need. You know, numbness, this notion of not feeling and what have you, is a serious thing. Ask a leper, right? You can get hurt. You can, get, you can literally lose a limb from your body if, if you don't have that sense of pain that our nerves are so generous to tell us of. And so tonight, I, I want to encourage you to do an inventory of your own life as you go to a, your rest tonight. To ask God, Lord, might there be something that I haven't yet relinquished to you? Because none of us in this room, I feel certain, none of us want to be numb to the work of his Holy Spirit in our heart. Amen? We want to have, for the Lord to have full access so that we will feel as we have been designed to feel. Feel warm and love, yes, but also feel pain and guilt when it's necessary to wake us up to our need for him. May God help each one of us to be honest in our walk with him. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we listen to the doctor tonight about neuropathy and the the condition and, and more importantly how we can do things to improve and to overcome some of the debilitating aspects of this of this issue lord i pray that in our spiritual walk that you would please work in our hearts in such a manner that we will sense your prodding we will sense your your work in our hearts and we will not walk away we will not deny your spirit's entrance into our heart. And if you reveal something that we need to repent of, Lord, please help us to do so, for we dare not grieve your Holy Spirit. We want, Lord, for you to have full access into each of our hearts, that we might feel and believe and experience life as you designed it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The time is yours. Thanks, Pastor Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy was a common name in the late 80s, early 90s, maybe, but I could never find any, um, I don't know if you ever had this experience, but I could never find those little pins and, you know, trinkets you find when you go to the store that have people's names on them. They always had John and <clears throat> all the other J's, but um, never Jeremy in any case.
I like quinoa too, Rhoda. I'm glad you mentioned that wherever you are. <clears throat> quinoa is a wonderful grain. Looks like it should be pronounced quinoa, but it's nonetheless pronounced quinoa, and it's a complete protein, and you can use it anywhere that you would use rice. Um, I, 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 I eat it all the time. <clears throat> Let's turn on our presentation now, see if this works. Okay, there we go. So, um, that's my address there in, um, <clears throat> in Morristown. I'm in the Main Health Star building there, uh, right, right in the middle of town, along with all the other Health Star family practice and internal medicine um, physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs. <clears throat> And um, so my, my specialty is physical medicine and rehabilitation, and that's kind of a... I'm used to having to explain this quite a lot because people inevitably ask you, what, um, what is that specialty? Because it's not family practice, and it's not general surgery, and it's not one of the more conventionally, generally understood um, uh, types of medicine out there. So uh, to make a long, complicated story much, much, com much compacted, um, it's a branch of medicine that deals with physical injury and rehabilitating people. Um, we, we deal a lot uh, with, <clears throat> we dabble, I should say, maybe perhaps, a little bit in sports medicine and in orthopedics. Um, sometimes you'll see physical medicine specialists working in rheumatology settings. Um, sometimes you'll see them working uh, in, in a wide variety, even in neurology settings. As you may have surmised, there is, surmised, there is a teeny bit of overlap between um, neurology and physical medicine. Um, which is interesting, uh, Rhoda, I, what you said reminded me that um, I had forgotten that Rhoda, Rhoda's husband, which you may know is a, is a neurologist, and he went to um, the, he was at the same uh, internship program in, in Kalamazoo, Michigan that I was at a few, a few years before me, but uh, nonetheless in the same place, so that was kind of a, um, a, a neat memory that she reminded me of. So in any case, uh, that's my specialty, especially sometimes uh, you will hear it referred to as physiatry or physiatry. Definitely not psychiatry, though. Uh, there is only one C, that tiny little C difference between physiatry and psychiatry, but it, there's a world of difference, obviously, between the, world, the words, uh, the meanings of the words. So, um, All right, so now actually on into our, uh, the meat, meat of our presentation. So, uh, obviously, the, the scope of our discussion tonight is the peripheral nervous system. So, you generally divide the, the nervous system of the body into central portions and peripheral portions. And central portions are those portions that you would think of as being inside the brain, um, inside the spinal cord. And um, I, don't, I don't deal with those. That's the, that's the, that's the area of neurology. So if you, if you have some central nervous system pathology, um, you should see a neurologist. And, and I say that because um, this may be hard to wrap your mind around. Symptoms from central nervous system problems and symptoms from peripheral nervous system problems can be identical um, in, in the patient's perceptions. Um, so people can, people can have a, a paresthesias, a tingling and numbness from a stroke when their peripheral nervous system is perfectly intact. And so, um, <clears throat> just thought I would, I would mention that. Um, so, you can, you can divide this peripheral nervous system further into autonomic and somatic uh, subsystems. Uh, autonomic is kind of a funny word that doesn't come up in conversation very often. You can, you can think of it in your mind as automatic. That might be a little bit more accessible. This is the part of your nervous system that does things that you don't think about, like uh, Digestion, for example, you know, when you eat something, you don't think, sit down and think, okay, your stomach, digest. No, your, your, your body just does that for you, um, which is nice because that's not something that, you know, you really want to have to stop and think about. Um, and then the rest of it, somatic sub subsystems, the things that are under our willful control, um, obviously muscles are the most significant thing that come to mind. So, <clears throat> um, and then... Two parts of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Um, the sympathetic makes you, uh, makes you go and run, makes your blood pressure go up and your heart rate go up, and the parasympathetic does the opposite. It says, slow down, let's have some digestion, just relax. So there's two, two kind of competing 
opposite systems within the autonomic nervous system. But it's all part of, of, the, of the peripheral nervous system. So um, I, I like this picture. I, can you guys see that all right? I hope so. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of what a, um, a peripheral nerve might look like. And this, this particular example is um, one that would be uh, connected to a muscle, probably. And so, let's see if this pointer works. This little part right here is actually inside your spinal cord. And then this little axon comes outside your spinal cord and all the way down your arm or leg to the corresponding muscle fibers that it controls. So the point of that is that, you know, obviously these little axons, as they're called, can be quite long. Uh, in fact, if you, you could argue the point that um, the axons of the tibial nerve that start on your back and go all the way to your toe are the, uh, is the longest nerve and possibly the, the longest cell and po quite possibly the, 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 the largest cell by volume in, in the human body by, just by um, of its extremely long axon, axon, which can be a meter long. That's over three feet. So, anyhow, and then this is, uh, of course, connected to uh, neuromuscular junction, which, which goes into muscle. We, we won't go there. <clears throat> uh, this, is a, this is what a sensory axon might, does look like. So this is the cell body of the sensory axon, which actually sits just outside the, outside the spinal cord, and this part of it reaches, reaches into the spinal cord. And, uh, and think, again, this part goes down the arm or leg and um, carries sensory information to your brain, like uh, pain and touch, temperature, uh, position of your, your joints in three-dimensional space, um, tension, tension of all the muscles that you're um, controlling. There's a huge amount of information that comes up these uh, sensory nerves uh, to your brain. Uh, all very important stuff. But so um, you get the idea that a, a, a nerve is very, a very funny, funny shaped um, cell. It's not at all like a, um, a typical cheek cell, a, a blob with a nucleus, if you will. <clears throat> it's a very specialized structure, and, and, and I get excited about this. Uh, you guys probably are excited too. <clears throat> okay. So um, if you were to blow, uh, let's, see, let's see, go back. So this little axon right here, these little guys, if you go back to my picture here, oh no, what happened? Did I turn it off somehow? Oh, there we go, okay. Yep, mm -hmm. so this, this little blue thing right here is, is that axon that we looked at back here. So if you were to cut open a peripheral nerve, you would find, um, firstly, a, a bundle, a bundle of bundles. You guys ever looked inside a coaxial cable before? You know, it's not just a wire. It's a wire of wires. And the peripheral nerve is the same way. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nerve of nerves. And so you have these little axons, which are covered with their little um, myelin and Schwann cells, which we'll get into later, and they're bundled together into something called fascicles, and these fascicles are bundled together into a, into a peripheral nerve. And there's all kinds of different axons from all kinds of different nerve cells, all bundled up together in the same fascicles. They're sensory nerves, they're, they're carrying information to the brain, they're motor nerves carrying commands to muscles. There are all these different kinds of autonomic fibers that we talked about that control sweat glands, and, and you, know, you know when your hair stands on end, you know? That's the autonomic nervous system. So all the, some of these, as you can see in the picture, some of these individual axons are very large. Some of them are very small. Some of them are covered in this myelin goop, which we'll get into. Some of them aren't myelinated at all. Uh, so there's, um, there's, there's great variety and complexity present within a, um, within a peripheral nerve. Okay. Um, <clears throat> This is good. So how does, it, how does the peripheral nerve generate a, um, a message? Have you guys ever, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, when I was a resident in Detroit, um, it was, this, this would have been 2011. It just so happened this one particular year that, um, <clears throat> I'll try to make this story as short as possible. 
the Minnesota Vikings, um, it's a football team in, in, in uh, Min Minnesota, their stadium collapsed, and no one knew what to do because they had a game coming up, and um, it just so happened that the uh, football team that played in Detroit uh, was going to be gone um, that particular uh, day. It was, a th it was a Thursday evening. <clears throat> and so they arranged it so that the, the team in Minnesota could come to Detroit and play the football game there. And everyone was happy because they had a location. Of course, um, without going in, into it too much, there was no one particularly in Detroit that wanted to see this game. And so they went around hand handing out um, extremely discounted tickets, which I managed to get one of them for five bucks. And I thought, well, fine, cheap. I'll see it. It might be fun. It, it wasn't actually, but but it was kind of fun because they did this thing in the stadium. Maybe you guys have seen it before if you've ever been there. It's called the Wave, you know. And you're you're in this you're in this large building, and there's I don't know thirty thousand people there. And you see way on the other side of the stadium, you see a bunch of people go, whoa, and it goes and it comes all the stadium. Have you guys ever seen this before? There's me, and then, you know, you, and you, it's your turn, and you, woo, and how, it's really fun. So, this is a really terrific analogy for the way in which a nerve impulse proceeds down an axon. Um, so, the, the, the nerve spends a lot of energy kicking out sodium and hanging on to potassium. So, it creates this separation across this membrane, and what happens is when that signal comes down, that separation immediately flips and it just, it, it's just like the wave in, in the stadium, which just flips on down the axon. And um, it's, 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 it goes through um, special, special channels that are put there across the, across the axon membrane on purpose. Anyhow, it's, I don't want to get into it any more than that, because I'll probably start boring you guys to tears. But um, to me, it's a fascinating process. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, one of the things that the other picture left out, let me just back here, is these little Schwann cells. So you can see this is, this is if you will, a naked axon. There's nothing, there's nothing on it. But in reality, it's covered in these little funny-looking cells. <clears throat> um, this guy named, uh, that's a Schwann cell, by the way. This gentleman named Theodor Schwann, he was German. Um, he lived in the mid-1800s. I think he died in 1882. Anyhow, he was the father of modern histology, so he was a terrifyingly intelligent um, gentleman. He saw these little bumps along um, axons, and he didn't quite understand what they were or how they worked, but he thought, like any good histologist, I better name this after myself because it looks important, and so he did. Um, so we're left with his legacy, the Schwann cell, and that's not the only thing he named after himself. <clears throat> Anyhow, he's a very, a very smart person. Uh, uh, um, a, another smart Frenchman by the name of um, Louis Antoine, Louis Antoine Ranvier, came by and said, look at these little divisions between these Schwann cells. I wonder what they do. They look important. And so again, uh, the, he, 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 um, he lived about 25 years after the Schwann gentleman. So of course, like any other good histologist, he quickly named them after himself. And so we're left with these Schwann cells and nodes of Ranvier. <clears throat> and what this, allows, um, what this allows the nerve impulse to do is to jump from node to node rather than proceeding slowly down the axon and just skips, it skips. It's called saltatory conduction. Saltatory is a big fancy word that means jumping. So it just jumps from gap to gap to gap and this enables it to go really fast, you know, 50, 60 meters a second um, so that, you know, when you want to move your toe, you move it like that. Um, anyhow, these are very important, these little, these little Schwann cells, and, and they make this gunk, this, which is basically pure fat, highly organized, called myelin. And myelin is, a, is an electrical conductor, and it makes, it makes the impulse jump from, from node to node. Okay, enough about that. On to the next one. Here we go. Um, so that's kind of how a peripheral nerve functions. How does a peripheral nerve get blood? This is, a, this is an, a, a, a exceedingly important, the most important um, um, issue that we're going to talk about this, this evening. How does the peripheral nerve get blood? So, um, you, you, oftentimes in gross anatomy, when you study um, a muscle, for example, you study uh, its location, you study where it starts, 
where it begins, what joint it crosses. And then one of the things that you study, inevitably, is what artery supplies its blood. And it's very easy, generally, because one artery supplies one muscle. Not universally, but typically. So, but, uh, of course, a nerve, if you remember me talking about the tibial nerve, which starts in your back and goes all the way to your toe, one, one artery couldn't possibly supply that entire nerve. It's very long. And so it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a relay race, if you will. <clears throat> so the tibial nerve, for example, which, which actually uh, is part of the sciatic nerve for, for uh, the, in the posterior part of your thigh, um, at various times, depending on its location, gets its um, blood supply from the femoral artery, uh, and then the popliteal artery, and the posterior tibial artery, and, and the perineal artery. So we'll skip back here. And what these arteries do is they have little offshoots that go to this, um, this network of capillaries called the vasa nervorum. It's not a fun word. Um, anytime you see a fun word in medicine, you can just about bet that it's Latin or Greek. So, <clears throat> so this is, again, a, a different illustration of our peripheral nerve. You remember that slide a few, a few slides ago that showed our individual axons and fascicles and then the whole peripheral nerve itself. And you see these little capillaries, these are really, 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 really tiny. Um, but uh, a, a nerve is a very, very active place. Um, it's constantly churning energy to send, you know, burning through energy to send impulses along and to keep, um, <clears throat> and to keep that differential, that sodium and potassium differential uh, going. And so it, it needs really good blood supply, consistent like any other part of the body. <clears throat> so that's how a peripheral nerve gets blood. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, you know, this list of arteries is different for, for, every, um, for every nerve, but this isn't. The, the, the vaso nervorum is not different. It's, it's, it's very similar in every nerve. All right, I'm not quite sure what the next slide is. Let's find out. Oh, yes, okay. This is, this is good here. Okay, this is, this is not a nerve as you may have surmised. Like, this doesn't look anything like the stuff that we saw um, earlier. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> by the way, I, I should preface this in saying um, the reason we're talking about a nerve in such detail is so that when we start talking about what neuropathy is, we'll all be like, oh yeah, now I know what we're talking about. Um, in, in, and I apologize for this detailed stuff. I'm trying to break it down as much as I can. In, in, in medical school, we used to talk about, we used to talk about um, some classes were like, um, uh, drinking from a fire hose. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that expression before, but so I'll try not to do that to you. Um, but this is an animal cell. So um, <laughs> it's a blob. It's kind of a, a, a spherical blob. Um, you know, here's the DNA and where the nucleus is at and here's a bunch of other stuff. <clears throat> so let's say that, um, let's say that um, over here on the you know, far edge of the of the membrane of the cell, that it needs something. It, it, it needs some kind of enzyme that's coded for in the DNA. So it, no big deal. It just sends a message over there. Hey, listen, I need you to. I need you to find this gene. I need you to change it to the RNA. I need you to send it out to the ribosome so the ribosome can make it into protein. Then fold it. Then send it to where it needs to go. And it's a pretty straightforward process, right? There's. It's, it's not exactly the same distance to any part in the cell, but it's pretty close to that. And, and, and that's complicated enough, um, even though the distances involved are very, very, very tiny. But imagine, imagine if you will, um, that this, remember this is very short for the purposes of illustration, but imagine, imagine if this axon right here went, you know, kept going and going and going and going and going. For the purposes of scale, let's imagine that this axon was 10 miles long. <clears throat> and let's say that the end of it was running low on um, some, of those, some of those ion channels that we talked about. Well, <clears throat> the, codes, the codes and the, and the machinery to uh, transcribe and translate and make more of those are found way up here in the nucleus. How in the world? Is, is it going to get that message back to the nucleus? Listen, me, way far away from you, I need you to make me a copy of this. Well, it does. It gets that message back there, and, and this is a, just a miraculous thing. There, there's, a, there's a system inside a cell, um, and, and it's, it's basically a, a superhighway, if you think of it as that way. 
and uh, it's called axonal transport. It's these, it's these little microtubules, cyto cytoskeleton, and they just, it's like a handoff. It's a handoff, right? So they just they say, okay, what do you got for me? Where's it going? Okay, we'll ship it on down there. This is like the UPS system. So if you had to send something 10 miles away, you'd, um, you'd uh, slurp it on the UPS truck, and they'd take it wherever it, um, it needs to go and drop it off. Um, only this is really, really, really tiny. And, of course, all this takes energy. So you can see these little, for the purpose of illustration, you can see these little, my pointer doesn't work anymore. Yeah, we go, okay. You can see these little mitochondria, there's little powerhouses there, they're there too, doing their thing, making energy. So that's the external transport system. So, um, now you can start, start to get a sort of an idea of what a peripheral axon is like and, and what shape it is and the processes that have to go on inside it and how it gets its blood supply and, um, well, it's, 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 it's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> Makes me excited. And so we'll take a break with the Bible verse. There you go. <laughs> For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. So now that we've exhaustively um, studied, <clears throat> somewhat exhaustively studied the peripheral nerve and, and uh, how those fibers work and, and what they need to work, we can appreciate that statement um, even more. I should have perhaps told you in the beginning how poorly I did in public speaking in college. <clears throat> that wasn't because I... Um, didn't like it, it's just because I, um, I didn't attend the class enough. If I had read the syllabus carefully, I would have, I would have realized that um, my teacher, very wisely, um, <clears throat> had a system of penalizing you 1% for every class period that you uh, skipped, so I passed. Um, anyway, my, my example is certainly not worth emulating, but <clears throat> I don't know if you, if, uh, p <clears throat> let's see, how would I say this? Physicians don't get training in public speaking. I'm digressing a bit, sorry. Um, like pastors do, and I often think that that is kind of a mistake because if you've ever been to a contending medical education conference before and listened to a physician talk about whatever topic, <clears throat> you may find sometimes that they're not very uh, interesting, I guess you might say. So um, I, try, I try not to be like that, although I probably am dry like many other physicians to some degree. So I threw that Bible verse in there to give us our brains a little break. Okay, moving on. And I'm not sure what slide is next. Yes, okay, here we go. <clears throat> what is neuropathy? Thank you, Pastor, for the way by that definition. Uh, so disease or dysfunction of one or more peripheral nerves uh, to the causing weakness or numbness. And it, sh it should be mentioned this too, that um, th you can also have neuropathy of th those autonomic fibers that I talked about. So it's not just weakness of your muscles or numbness um, that can be an issue. Those autonomic fibers control all kinds of important things. Just because you can't think about them doesn't mean they're not important. They control, um, for example, the caliber of your uh, um, blood vessels. The smooth muscle around your arteries is controlled by your autonomic nervous system. So that when you stand up, um, all the blood doesn't go straight to your um, feet, uh, and all kinds of things are under, under the autonomic uh, nervous system control. <clears throat> and so um, it's not just weakness of muscles, it's also um, all kinds of other things can happen when you start getting the autonomic fibers involved. And the one thing about autonomic fibers is, is that they're smaller, and the smaller fibers are far more susceptible to neuropathic damage early than the, than the big, giant uh, motor and sensory cells are. <clears throat> okay, enough of that. So here we go. This is, I guess I got I to gotta head myself a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so sensory neuropathy, motor neuropathy, uh, sensory motor neuropathy, and then I forgot to mention um, on, on this slide, of course, autonomic neuropathy. Now, um, oftentimes these won't really exist by themselves, even though they're, they're, they're technically entities with different symptoms. They'll all exist together because remember that, remember that picture we had of a nerve? All those axons are all packed in together and they're all affected by the same process. <clears throat> so, um, all right, next, let's see the next slide. Okay, so this is a, a causes of neuropathy in our country. And this is not 
not completely exhaustive, but it's a decent list. Um, if, you were in, if you were talking about outside this country, you would include leprosy in there, which is a reasonably common, unfortunately, cause of neuropathy outside our country. Um, diabetes is by far and away the most common cause of neuropathy in the United States. And I, and I, and I promised myself when I put this um, together that this was not going to be a treatise on diabetes. So I've, I've, I've done a hard, uh, hard job not to make that so, although I think I may have failed in some respects. <clears throat> Chronic alcoholism and autoimmune diseases, um, things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, uh, inherited neuropathies, um, things like sarcoidosis, and then I should have put amyloidosis in there too. Um, nutritional deficiencies, usually uh, folic acid or vitamin B12 or vitamin B6, either in excess or, in, or not enough. Uh, physical trauma, and I should include in physical trauma um, uh, compressive issues too, like carpal tunnel syndrome or tarsal tunnel syndrome or cutal tunnel syndrome or um, in, any one of um, quite a number of, of possible sites of nerve compression. That, that's kind of the idea of physical trauma there. Um, uh, even um, uh, gunshot wounds um, and um, you know knife wounds, things like that. I used to see that a lot in Detroit when when I was when we were residents, unfortunately. And then you have many viruses and infectious agents. Um, you know, you all probably have dealt with things like shingles before. That can that can be uh, leave some behind some very unpleasant neuropathic pain. Um, in other parts of the country, um, they deal with Lyme disease. We fortunately don't have that endemic um, in this part of our state, at least not right now. <clears throat> uh, there are plenty of toxins and medications. Um, probably the biggest culprit for that uh, that we think of are chemotherapy medications, the kind of medications that make you, uh, give you nausea and vomiting and make your hair fall out, uh, oftentimes will um, give you neuropathy as well. And then vasculitis. Um, vasculitis is, is inflammation inside your, your, your arteries and veins. And, um, so, All right, next slide. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm going to go back to this for a second. So, you know, quite some number of decades ago, people started talking about modifiable risk factors, and this is, you know, before my time. Um, modif so, in order to understand how to prevent said disease, it's helpful to understand um, what kinds of things cause you to have whatever the disease is, whether it's coronary artery disease or, or, or uh, peptic ulcer disease or hypertension or strokes or whatever. What is the list of things that, that put people at risk for a given disease that can be altered? Because as a society, you know, if we can alter those things, we can potentially have a big impact on morbidity for that said disease within society. That's the general idea of, of modifiable risk factors. Okay, so the, these are, that's a pretty, sorry, I moved that. This is a pretty decent list of modifiable risk factors uh, which I garnered in my research. Um, diabetes, smoking, alcoholism, um, obesity, hypertension, and raised triglycerides, and you might put in there um, raised cholesterol as well. Now, going back to this picture again, and I included a second picture here, which you may realize is different. This is the picture that we saw, I'm not sure, 15 slides ago or so. This is a nice, healthy vasonervorum that's giving this peripheral nerve all the good blood that it needs. This is kind of a less healthy, diseased vasonervorum, and you can tell this, gray, this nerve is kind of gray and sad looking. You can put a little frowny face there if you want. Um, <clears throat> so, just keep this picture in the back of your head. Just file it there, and we'll we'll keep on going. Okay. Uh, now, I, I promise you, I got these these lists and these sources from completely different sources. I didn't just take the same list and just flip it a little bit. This is a completely different source. Are you guys ready? Are you sitting down? This is really cool to me. Risk factors for small vessel disease. Well, first of all, what is small vessel disease? Is that, is that um, <clears throat> well, it is kind of what it sounds. Um, it's it's uh, diseases that affect the really tiny capillaries and arterioles in your body. So, you know, like you have your aorta that's really big, and then you have your femoral artery that's a little bit bigger, and then you, smaller, and then you have your popliteal artery that's a little bit smaller. And, 
And eventually you get smaller and smaller and smaller until it branches and branches and branches and becomes an arteriole and then a capillary. So small vessel disease is um, our problems with these capillaries. Um, and, you know, very much like this picture shows you, these little tiny capillaries here, they're just diseased. They're either completely or partially occluded, and all these structures that they're nourished by just aren't getting enough blood, they're not getting enough energy, they're not getting enough oxygen, they're not, and they're not thriving. <clears throat> now I'm going to go to the next slide, which I think is this one. Yes, okay. Now these are for completely different, these are come from completely different sources. This isn't the same, uh, the same paper that, that um, got these two. This one on the left is a risk factor comparison um, risk factor for neuropathy. These are the risk factors for small vessel disease. I'll just let you read through that. When I, when I saw this, it just about smacked me upside the forehead. It was so dramatic. They're the same. You guys see that, right? They're the same. Wow. That blew me away. <clears throat> Why are they the same? That's a good question. Let's proceed on. Oh, yeah, I put this caveat in here. Uh, it, it may be helpful for you to discuss these things with your physician if you are um, um, interested in um, your, your neuropathy and what can be done about it. So, <clears throat> especially if you're on medication, they may need to be altered as you make changes. Okay, so we're going back to the risk, factor, risk factors here, and we're going to go through them one by one real quick. That uh, may not be super quick, but... Um, here we go. All right. So, uh, if you have diabetes, um, what can be done to improve that, or, or perhaps <clears throat> completely eliminate it? or to decrease your medication burden. <clears throat> well, and this is all pretty good advice, um, which, which makes pretty good sense to me. Avoid simple carbohydrates. You can insert the word there if you would like uh, at the end, sugar. Um, <clears throat> excess sugar. Exercise routinely. Yeah, about five times a week for half an hour. Walking is, is, a, is a good start. I think sometimes people feel that, you know, I can't, I can't like, Wait, I'm just going to, you know, there's not much point in me exercising because I really can't do very, but very much, but I would encourage you that um, walking is actually great exercise. It really is. <clears throat> so, and, 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 and walking around your job doesn't count. I, I, ha I do get that. Occasionally, some people say, well, I, I walk half an hour in my work. I'm, no, 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 that doesn't count. Half an hour of walking every, well, five times, I should say five times a week, but you do need a little rest. <clears throat> um, the other thing that can dramatically help your diabetes is uh, keep your, keeping your BMI in normal weight, uh, in a normal range, losing weight. Um, we'll talk about that again. Um, the other thing that's helpful is, is not smoking. The combination of smoking and diabetes is extremely potent uh, for increasing your risk for neuropathy, um, that, that combo. <clears throat> and, and avoiding alcohol is uh, also an excellent idea if you have uh, uh, diabetes because, again, it's another insult to the peripheral nerve. The more nerves are very sensitive to being insulted, as all, as all the rest of us are. You know, the more things they have that make their life difficult, um, the more they respond by just not working. So, um, and, and they're more susceptible to. Um, some of the metabolites of, of alcohol that your, your, your brain is at least slightly protected from, so. <clears throat> okay, elevated BMI, I put in there obesity. And uh, I, will, I will agree wholeheartedly that losing weight is hard, gaining weight is easy. There, that was profound, I know. Um, I, I see this a lot in, in my practice, and, and I've seen it in my own life, too. And one of the things that happens as you, as you age, a lot of things happen as you age, but at least for our purposes, um, y your, your metabolism slows down, and you don't need as many calories every day. Um, also, some other things happen. Age-related sarcopenia, the, the amount um, and density of muscle fiber that you have just decreases with, with, with time as you age. It's, 
Um, it's, no, it's, it's, it's no fun. Um, well, you know, you lose, you lose other types of, of cells as you age too, unfortunately, brain cells, um, uh, kidney cells, just a little bit at a time as you age. And um, so a lot of times what happens is, and, and I know this to be the case in my own life, the things that I could do when I was in my 20s, I just can't do anymore in terms of, of, um, of eating. I know uh, if I eat the same things that I ate when I was 20, I, I, I can't. I just can't do it. So um, <coughs> I actually have uh, lost about 25 pounds over the last year and a half. And uh, so it, uh, it can be done. And... Um, and uh, Keep up, um, keep up the attempt, even if you're frustrated. <clears throat> the other things that can be helpful, again, exercise five times a week. Um, avoid alcohol because uh, alcohol, is, firstly, it's very bad for you. It only has a lot of calories in it. Um, so you may find some overlap, again, as we go through these lists. And I promise these are all from different sources. Yeah, I didn't just take the, the same list and flip it around a little bit. Um, all right, next here, hypertension. <clears throat> uh, exercise routinely. Hmm, okay, I, I, I lose weight. Eat a healthy diet. Um, keep a di food diary if necessary. You know, this is actually something that I did. I used um, My Fitness Pal, which is a fantastic app on your phone, um, which helps you keep track of, of everything that goes in your mouth. Which is far is far easier with time as you as you, uh, it's far easier with time. Um, the first few months are labor intensive, I will, I will freely admit that, but pretty soon you get extremely good at estimating what's, how many calories are in a given food. Um, so, <clears throat> as a, and it's, it's uh, keeping a food diary is far easier than it used to be 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, limit your sodium intake, two milligrams a day, less is better. Um, limit processed foods, just because they have a lot of salt in them already. Don't, don't add extra salt. Um, to your, to your food. And again, these two are thrown in because they're important. Um, if you smoke, try to quit. Keep trying. I think I read something somewhere where the average smoker tries and fails to quit 15 times before they succeed. So um, keep trying. Keep trying. <clears throat> and again, avoid alcohol. You know, I thought it was very telling um, y you hear a lot. You hear a lot in, in, in literature about uh, the health benefits of wine and alcohol and, and, and such. But when you really dig into it, at least in the case of neuropathy, when you really dig into it, this is not something that's recommended. Something that's that's um, that's specifically pointed out. Avoid this. Let's see, oh, it's the next slide, I'm not sure I can remember. Yes, okay, raised, triglyc raised triglycerides. Um, again, this is from a different source. This is not the same source, avoid alcohol. I know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm starting to sound like a broken record, I know. <laughs> um, so for um, working with raised triglycerides, now you wanna keep less than 20% of your calories consumed from fat and keep saturated fat less than 7% of calories. And, and usually uh, translated that into English. Limit sources of saturated fats from animal sources and avoid trans fats. Um, avoid refined carbohydrates. And I put in here liquid calories, and, and actually I didn't put that in, that was in the paper. Liquid calorie, calories can be translated um, soda, pop, wherever you, whatever word you might use to describe that. Um, <clears throat> uh, sugar, sugary drinks. Uh, and of course, don't forget fiber, which is a great way of, of washing things out of you. Lose weight, exercise regularly. That's all pretty good advice. Let's see, where am I at? Oh yes, um, <clears throat> if you need help with smoking or alcoholism, there's a lot of help out there uh, for you. Um, and and you know, if you go to your, your um, primary care nurse practitioner or PA or physician and say, um, any one of these things, I'm, I'm I'm obese, I want to lose weight, can you help me? Um, I'm smoking, I want to quit, can you help me? Um, you know, I drink too much alcohol, I want to quit, can you help me? I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know a healthcare provider alive who wouldn't gladly say, yes, I will help you. 
<clears throat> so, um, keep trying if you're having an issue with these things. They're, they're very bad for you. Not just for neuropathy. Okay, so in summary, I tried to take all the things that um, recurred, which were kind of most of them, and put them together in a summary. And again, we, were, we are addressing... I'm zooming back here. These risk factors for... Modifiable risk factors for neuropathy. <clears throat> the, six, the six worst ones, and these are, these are again in the U.S. So we just went through a list of things that you can do. I suppose I should say one more thing um, about these issues. If you are diabetic, be, make sure to, you know, be compliant with your medication regimen. Monitor your blood sugar, follow the advice of your physician. Again, the same thing would apply with hypertension. You know, be compliant with your medication regimen. Monitor your blood pressure. Um, work with your doctor, work with your PA or nurse practitioner. Raise triglycerides as well, you know. Um, listen to what your doctor says and, 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 and just be compliant with their medication regimen in, in addition to the stuff we talked about. Zooming on back to where we left off. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, here we go. So, <clears throat> to summarize all that stuff up, uh, avoid alcohol and smoking. I think that was on almost every one of them. Lose weight if overweight or obese. Uh, exercise regularly. Eat a healthy diet. Avoid excess processed foods. Avoid excess saturated animal fats and excess sodium. Eat plenty of fiber, and I translated that again, fruits and vegetables. Avoid excess refined carbs, and I translated that into English, sugar. Um, and now you may be asking or thinking in the back of your mind, well, I already have neuropathy. You know, the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. <clears throat> Now, the good news about this is these, these, these aren't just modifiable risk factors for preventing something. These are excellent things to do to improve neuropathy if you already have it. Um, a lot of times I'll, I will, I will uh, get the question after I, after I diagnose someone with neuropathy, well, what can I, um, what can I do? And uh, I, I don't have, you know, I don't have... 35, 40 minutes, obviously, to, to go through this entire presentation with every patient, but I will go through an abbreviated, uh, abbreviated form of this, um, very abbreviated form of this. <laughs> I, 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 did, I did once run into a, a very nice patient who, who told me that, um, that she was going to switch primary care physicians because she, she got tired of, of her primary care physician because every time um, she went to him, he, he told her that... Um, that she needed to lose weight and quit smoking. And she said, well, I, I quit going to him because he ever told me, all he ever told me to do. Um, but I kind of made me chuckle. I'm like, but I looked her right, right in the face and I said, you know we're supposed to tell you that, right? I mean, it's part of our job. Um, <clears throat> so we're supposed to give you information about things that you can do, not just medications that can consequences of, of what's going on, but also uh, real strategies that you can use, that you can do, that can improve your condition. And she's like, yeah. I, she admitted to me that, yeah, she knew that she was just, you know, sort of maybe he had been dwelling on it too much. But um, su suffice to say, um, some of this stuff may be, may be unpleasant, uh, un but uh, it's something that can really help you if you have neuropathy uh, or... Um, if you think you might be uh, on the road to having neuropathy. So that concludes my presentation, and I think, if I'm right, we're gonna have a question and answer session? Okay, I think Rhoda has a microphone there, so. I will, I will do my best to answer your questions as well, if you have any. So raise your hand if you have any. And Just real simple. Uh, is drop foot the same thing? Is, a, is that neuropathy? Um, yeah, it, it, can, it can happen <clears throat> from compression of a nerve that comes across the outside of your, of your bone here. It's very shallow there, especially in thin, tall people. Um, 
It can, it can actually also happen from compression of your L5 nerve root in your lumbar spine, or even your L4 for that example. So both those, both those are forms of compressive neuropathy or physical neuropathy where a nerve is, is either stretched or compressed or smashed or you know, something beyond what it can handle. Nerves are actually very, they're designed to be very, designed, I like that word, to be very physically resilient. They have, they, there's a little tortuosity there, a little extra nerve. So, you know, like the nerve in our brain doesn't have to move very much. It's just pretty much static. It's in there, it's done. But a nerve that goes down your arm, you know, you can do all kinds of interesting things with your arm and your leg, and your nerve has to be able to, to stretch and expand and handle that movement. And so um, it's, it's designed to be able to do that. But there are, you know, examples where <clears throat> you might do something that goes beyond the physical capacity of that nerve. Like carpal tunnel syndrome is the most common one, and that's the same, same idea. Or cubital tunnel syndrome for the ulnar nerve on the inside of the elbow. It's, a, it's the same idea. It's just a, a side of... of a, physical, repetitive physical trauma to a nerve. Uh, can neuropathy just affect the toes or does it affect the whole foot? Well, um, it, it typically affects the toes first um, because uh, it, it, we call it a length dependent process because the longer a nerve is, the more susceptible it is to neuropathy because the more pronounced its unique shape, the, the harder it becomes for it to exist, the longer it is, because it has to power all those axonal transport systems you know, that we talked about. And so it typically starts in your toes. That is very common. Um, it can proceed um, upward into your foot and sometimes even up to your knee. Um, yes, does that answer your question? Here, I just want to think. A little clearer understanding of what is diabetes doing to the nerve? Yes. What, is it reversible if your diabetes gets better? Yes. Yes, it is, um, to a point. So di diabetes is, of course, a, a, for the purpose of the nerve, it, we're less concerned about what's my blood sugar level, you know? For the purposes of the nerve, we're concerned about more the fact that diabetes creates inflammation in the, in the microvasculature and, 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 and gums up these vaso, the vasoneuvorum that we read, uh, that, we, that we saw about. And so that is the mechanism of damage for diabetes. It's also the same thing that produces problems in your retina and the same thing that produces problems in your kidney. It's that, it's that problem that diabetes causes in your, your really tiny, in your small vessels. Yeah, and, and it, it, it is reversible. You can come to a point where I would say it would, it's not a re reversible, reversible, but at least at that point, it is still improvable. A, oftentimes, you'll get, you'll get to a point where you're on the max dose of gabapentin and you just can't take any more because it'll just knock you out. And, and you're still experiencing you know, profound burning pain. It feels like you have fire ants all over your legs. And what do you, you know? People say, what do I do? You know, I can't take any more gabapentin. Like, I'll, I'll be comatose if I do. And so um, those people can improve, improve their pain control and improve their neuropathy by um, more, more closely controlling their diabetes and making those changes, yeah. I didn't want to steal too much Dr. MD's thunder, but he'll probably talk a bit about the, the, the blood vessels in the retina, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. My brother-in-law is an internal medicine doctor, and he's been treating peripheral neuropathy with 1B complex daily and 12.5 milligrams of iodorol every day. And he says the first month they don't see any difference, the second month they go maybe, and the third month they say definite improvement. Have you heard of anything like that in yeah, your you practice? You said vitamin B12 and what? It's B complex. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, one a day, and iodorol RX is what he uses, but it's iodine, 12.5 milligrams. Okay. And they take one of those daily, you know, one of each. Oh yeah, yeah. I definitely recommend a, a, a B B complex supplement. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. My question is, if you have damage from compressed compression in the spine, yes. 
or you know, a nerve that's pressed on, or if you've had damage from surgeries. Can you improve the neuropathy through the diet and exercise, or does after, say, a year, uh, the nerves stop, stop regenerating and healing? Okay, so if you've had like a, a, a disc issue in your low back that compressed a nerve or something like that, and you have neuropathic pain from that, can you still improve the pain with these changes? Is that kind of what you were? Yes. Yeah. Um, that is an excellent question. About the best answer I could give you would probably be a firm maybe. <laughs> um, I have noticed, though, that with certain exercises, it's almost like it gets really warm. And it's, I, think, I suppose that's blood circulation, which is probably good because the pain eases. It just doesn't stay that way. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if the exercise... Maybe if you're doing the right ones. I would encourage um, low to moderate intensity aerobic exercise probably about five times a week. What do you think about yoga well, with um, balance? What do I think about yoga? Another excellent question. <laughs> very, I'm impressed. These are very good questions. Um, I don't do yoga personally. Uh, I have some issues with the um, the mysticism that tends to be present. It's very hard to separate the stretching routines apart from um, the teachings of becoming one with the Brahman and becoming one with the with the, with the mystic God universe person. But I will tell you that uh, I think stretching is fantastic. Um, it's 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 uh, you know tight muscles are part of the chronic. I, mean, I had a, I had an attending physician one time that I always preached that. Tight hamstrings were part of the human condition, and if you weren't telling your patients to stretch out their hamstrings all the time, then you were failing. He was really dwelling on that. But um, so I would, I would encourage you to do stretching routines. Yes, definitely. And I would definitely not discourage anyone from, um, from, from exercise. What about Agent Orange? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I will caveat this by saying um, that this is my opinion, <laughs> and that you'll probably find opinions that, that differ. The, the problem with the mixtures of Agent Orange um, causing neuropathy, uh, according to my reading, was actually an, a, a poisonous additive um, that, was part of, that was part of the mixture. Um, and there are people that were exposed to very high levels of Agent Orange that did go on to develop neuropathy. Um, the, the chemical relationship actually between Agent Orange and, and some of the things that you can buy in the herbicide section of your, of your Lowe's or Home Depot stores um, is startlingly close. <laughs> um, they have, some of them have similar methods of action, but um, it was my understanding that there was an additive that they used at that time that was quite toxic. Um, and so there, there have been um, reports from people that were particularly, especially in Vietnam, where that was used extensively that had neuropathy. People um, like that were in the helicopters that were spraying it and stuff that, whose, whose flight suits would come home, come home, you know, just soaking, drenched wet in it. Um, that's a good question. And yeah, that did, that, that did happen. What is the role of physical therapy for trap nerves or trigger points, uh, that kind of painful nerve? Um, <clears throat> it, 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 there is definitely a role of physical therapy in just about, just about any, any condition you can think of, but I would say that and depending on the results of, you know, a, a, a nerve test, if, if the nerve damage is not profound and isn't actually causing wire loss or axon loss, then, then I would definitely recommend um, physical therapy after the neurolo neurological recovery has taken place. Um, as that, that, the muscle that's connected to that nerve, will, those, some changes will be going on in the neuromuscular junction and those nerve fibers that, that potentially were denervated um, sorry, muscle fibers that were potentially denervated will be reaching out 
um, you know, to other healthy axons around it, saying, re innervate me, you know. And once they're re innervated, they'll want to, um, because they've atrophied, they'll want to get stronger. So, yeah, definitely there's a. With it is also, there's some popularity of needling certain places to help nerve pain and muscle pain. Is there a mechanism for that? Um, I don't think that dry needling would be that helpful and for actually help for, for um, really affecting neuropathy. It might give you some temporary pain relief. Um, and it's used for, it's used for a lot of different things. A lot of musculoskeletal pain, especially tender points and trigger points, chronic muscle pain, um, I think it can be helped a lot in that. But I think the relief, the, the benefits for, for neuropathy would probably be pretty temporary. And then, of course, you'll get into the fierce arguments that occur between physical therapists that do dry needling and acupuncturists. <laughs> they're, they're, they're um, how would I say this, bitter antagonists of each other. You know, the one is saying, you're doing acupuncture and you don't know what you're doing. And the physical therapist is saying, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm encouraging the release of, uh, you know, anti-inflammatory cytokines or, or what, whatever the case may be. But um, that's a good question. Is there any connection between neuropathy and the sensation of the tightening, what feels like the tightening of skin in the toes and, you know, if this is your toes and the part right here, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just like you've got a tight, tight glove on yeah. or the skin is too tight. Is that a precursor? Or how, how is that? Any Are you saying on like the bottom of your foot primarily? Well, maybe, but maybe, maybe. yeah. Um, what I would say is that you can have all kinds of really odd sensations, as there's, as particularly as a part of sensory neuropathy. Um, oftentimes, people find it really hard to describe what they're feeling, and they'll end up saying, I just can't tell you. It feels like some people will say, I feel bugs crawling on my skin. When I look down and there aren't any there, some people will say, I feel like there's flowing water, you know, going across my skin, but there isn't. Or I feel like there's a bump underneath my foot that I'm constantly stepping on that it's not there. Or I feel like my sock is bunched up, but it isn't. Or, 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 or so I would say that that type of sensation could definitely be possible. But it would be typically accompanied by some numbness somewhere, probably in your in your foot or toe, if it were attributable, attributable to neuropathy. I am wondering this and thinking this is true, but I don't know that arthritis can cause a lot of this pain and neuropathy. And my thinking, at least right now, is that perhaps through the diet. I mean, I know exercise also, but primarily a lot of the foods we eat, maybe with introducing more anti-inflammatory foods, that that might help with the arthritis, and then that might help in turn with the neuropathy. Is there a connection with all this? A connection between arthritis and neuropathy, or a connection between the, the foods we eat and the severity of arthritis? All of them. All of them. Okay. <laughs> no. um, well, I'll answer the first question first. Um, I mean, typically arthritic pain is, is, is a constant, dull, annoying ache that, um, that's centered around, you know, a, centered around a joint. And typically neuropathic pain or pain that comes from a nerve problem is usually um, uh, burning and tingling. And it is entirely possible to have both of those together. The, the, the most common way you see that is with hand osteoarthritis and carpal tunnel syndrome. People will come in and, and they have visible, you know, arthritis in their hands, and, and but they have burning and tingling at the same time. So it, it is it is quite common to find both things existing in the same in the same part of the body together, side by side. Um, and um, trying, yeah, keeping a, a, a um, anti-inflammatory diet will, will positively affect both those things if they're present. I just wanted to say an encouragement to this lady here that um, I had surgery and inguinal hernia repair and was told a year later by the doctor that it would never go away, this numbness that I had. And um, so I'm thinking I'm going to live with that for the rest of my life. But then it went away 
And what was interesting was uh, I had been taking B-complex for one reason, and I owed her all 12.5 milligrams for another reason. And so when my brother-in-law told me about the two things he was treating peripheral neuropathy with, I said, oh, wow, maybe that helped the nerve, you know, for that surgery. So. My son, since he was like a teenager, he's 29 now, has complained with his toes being numb, just his big toe, mm -hmm. being both of his toes being numb. Mm -hmm. He says they don't hurt. It's just like a numb feeling, like you know when your feet goes to sleep. And now if his toes get stepped on or something, it hurts. He can still feel. He has yes. full feeling. It just feels numb in just his toes. They don't bother him in any other way. And it started when he was about a teenager. In his big toe? Yes, only his big toes big only. Toe. Yeah. Does he have a large callus on the, on the inside of his big toes? No. no. Hmm. And the only, the, he started like he was in band and marching. And to do the proper march is whenever the toe and heel or whatever, however he marched, that's when it started bothering him. Mm -hmm. And like I said, that's when he was um, well in middle school. Mm -hmm. And then as he's gotten older, it's never went away. Hmm. It's just his big toes numb. That's it. Is he flat-footed at all? Is he what? Is he flat-footed? No. no. Not I don't think so, no. Hmm. That is interesting. I, I is can't. that a form of neuropathy? Or? Well, he definitely has some of the symptoms of it. You know, any, any, any numbness is not a normal thing to have. The cause of that would be very hard to, to, to pin down, though. Right. I've had him to doctors, and they, you know, can't really find anything wrong. He's that's been x-rayed. Not everything. surprising. Yes, so that's why I thought... He's probably, a, had, he's probably had several EMGs before, too, huh? Yeah. yeah there's, they can't find nothing wrong. Yeah. The so is that a form of neuropathy, arthritis, uh, circulation? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I would say that he probably has you know, some, some process that's impacting the very distal fibers of his, of his sensory nerves there. The problem is that when you do an EMG, you can't, you can't really test the sensory nerves in the toes. They're just too far away. And there's no really great way to get the distance separated from your electrodes and your stimulating electrodes to get a good study there. And, uh, and the sensory nerves are too small to really be seen well on an MRI, so that there's just no great way of objectively finding out information about that part. part. He's never took nothing for it. Yeah. He's never took no medication for it or nothing. Yeah. And I didn't know if there's there any kind of vitamin or something that might be uh, helpful. Well, multivitamin is a great idea just for general health. He has, but I don't know. That's not my only question, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. What about cauterizing nerves that send pain to your brain? Are you talking about like, a, like an interventional pain procedure where they fry nerves in your back? No, in your leg. Oh. Well, again, the problem with that is that the, 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 the different types of nerves are all mixed up together in the same peripheral nerve. So the, the, you know, the nerves that are um, sending pain messages are mixed in with all the autonomic nerves and the motor nerves in the same peripheral nerve. So it's very, it's impossible to cauterize um, you know, the axons that are bothering you without really destroying the rest of the peripheral nerve, which would, which would be a bad idea. That's a good question. What you do hear about, like, nerve-burning procedures that, you know, occur in, in people's backs. Yeah, you're talking about in the leg, yeah. Uh, is restless leg syndrome, is that a form of neuropathy? Um, you know, people often take gabapentin and, and medications that help with, with, with peripheral neuropathy to improve the symptoms of restless leg syndrome. But restless leg syndrome is more typically thought of as a movement disorder than as a problem with the peripheral nerve. Um, that's a good question. Okay, I think all right. that's well, all well, the questions. Well, thank you all, those are really great questions. They were very good questions. <clears throat> Again, I wanna <clears throat> thank you all for coming. And um, as you leave, 
there's a sack lunch on the table, so please take one with you when you go. Um, and I failed to mention that when you prepare your hamburger, or your oat burger in this case, put your lettuce and your onions and whatever else you like to use on a burger, add that to this. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. So before you go, I just want to thank you again for coming. And I hope you have a safe trip home. And let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us all together here this evening. And thank you for the wonderful information that we could learn from Dr. Wetmore tonight. I pray that you will go with each person as they travel to their homes and with, that they will take this information with them and that they will benefit from it in the days to come. We love you and we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next time. Jordan, will you run this upstairs for me? Hello. <laughs>